OK, um, so for those of you that tried to install SDPV, I'm sorry to put you through that. I hope some of you succeeded. <laughs> I, I know some, some people succeeded, but I know others had trouble. So for those that did install it, uh, you can follow, around, uh, follow along um, with what I'm doing. Uh, go to this URL. Um, and download the folder that's there, um, and that will have um, uh, all the uh, all the files in it that we'll be playing with already for you. Okay, so so what's the summary so far? So we considered a four point function. Uh, and in this, the special case of identical scalars, it has the following form. Um, and uh, this function here has a conformal block expansion. It's a sum over operators O appearing in the phi phi OPE, squared OPE coefficients, one coefficient coming from each uh, OPE that we had to do to evaluate the four point function, a conformal block, which depends on the dimension and spin of O, um, and we also had that this function. Um, has to be invariant under permutations of the points. Um, and in particular, this uh, gave us a constraint that g of u and v is equal to u over v to the delta phi times g of v comma u. Um, and uh, let's see, we also had that um, uh, only even L's appear, and the dimensions satisfy unitarity bounds. So d minus 2 over 2 for L equals 0, and L plus d minus 2 for L greater than 0. OK. So these are all uh, all the consequences of symmetry, conformal symmetry, and unitarity. Um, and you can see that they, they take you pretty far. Um, but uh, not all is clear. This conformal block expansion ha picks out a particular channel. So it uh, appears to break the permutation symmetry between these points. Um, and so the consistency of this expansion with this equation um, is unclear. Um, and just to give you a sense of the kinds of things um, that you need in order to satisfy this equation, uh, let's look at um, a, a limit of the equation. So let's look at the small u limit. And you remember this uh, u is uh, x12 squared, x34 squared over x13 squared, x24 squared. So this is the, the OPE limit where uh, 1 and 2 are approaching each other. Um, so uh, uh, in this limit, the conformal blocks uh, g delta l, oh, thank you so much, uh, of u comma v, we derived goes like u to the delta over 2 plus higher order in u. And there's some function of v uh, that can also appear that, I'm, uh, that will not be so important, but you can imagine that it's there. Um, and uh, it turns out that g delta l of v comma u goes like log u in the small u limit. Okay, So this is the, uh, this is the conformal block um, in the usual channel, and this is the conformal block in the cross channel. Um, and you can verify this. Uh, you remember we wrote down these expressions for the blocks in terms of hypergeometric functions. 
Um, and this just comes at looking from looking at a 2F1 uh, in an expansion. So we had something like this, where beta were various numbers. Um, the log comes from looking at this 2F1 in an expansion around x equals 1, as opposed to around x equals 0. OK, so um, let's look at uh, the behavior of the two sides of this equation in this limit. So uh, on, um, on the left-hand side, um, in the small u limit, the uh, lowest dimension operator contributes. And which is that? Someone said it, I think. Yes, the identity operator. Okay, so this is sum over all the operators, um, but the identity appears. And in particular, we should normalize phi so that the OP coefficient of the identity is one. That's equivalent to normalizing its two-point function to be one. Okay, so this thing looks like one plus dot dot dot. Um, on this side, what do we have? Um, well. Uh, we have a sum over blocks, and uh, each block looks like u to the delta phi from this prefactor here times log u plus dot dot dot. Okay, so each individual block goes to zero in the u goes to zero limit, um, which means that there's no way a finite number of blocks can reproduce this one. You need an infinite number of blocks. And basically what happens is that the convergence of the conformal block expansion, um, uh, basically that as u gets smaller, the blocks that reproduce the one come from higher and higher dimension operators on this side. OK, so we need an infinite number of operators to solve this equation. So uh, we have an infinite number of products of hypergeometric functions with, uh, with some coefficients and some dimensions that we don't know. It's a very complicated system. And uh, people stared at these equations for decades um, without making any progress, um, in higher dimensions at least, uh, towards solving the equations. Um, in 2D, of course, you can make lots of progress, but that's because of the additional symmetries that are present. Um, and what was thought was just that well, there's not enough symmetry in higher dimensions. Um, conformal symmetry gets you only so far, um, but, but now you're stuck. Um, but there was a new idea. Um, uh, so this idea is uh, uh, due to Rotazzi, Richkoff, Tani and Vicky in 2008. And their idea was, uh, well, maybe we can't just solve this equation exactly. Um, but perhaps we can extract useful information out of it nonetheless. Uh, and in particular, they thought, well, um, let's look at this equation uh, geometrically. Um, and see uh, and see what that implies. So okay, so let's write it uh, in the following way. We have a sum over operators O, F phi phi O squared. And I'll just take um, uh, everything and put it all on one side of the equation. So, um, and I'll multiply through by v to the delta phi. So on this side, so this is coming from uh, the left-hand side of the crossing equation, multiplied by v to the delta phi. And then we subtract the right-hand side, which looks like this. And let's call this quantity f delta phi 
delta L of u and v. So the key observation here um, is that, OK, these special functions are known. Um, and these coefficients, well, we don't know what they are, but we can say that they're positive, which is a consequence of unitarity. So in particular, the uh, OP coefficients of real operators are real. Um, you could think of this as just, well, these OP coefficients are, are three-point function coefficients. Um, and reflection positivity implies that three-point co function coefficients of real operators have to be real. Um, yes? Um, so the easiest way to do it is to just put the three points on a line and consider uh, uh, reflections in this direction. So the, the products of distances between the points will will not change, and those are just positive real numbers. So you get that the coefficient is a positive real number. Um, OK. Good. So this is not just any system uh, uh, of equations. It has positive coefficients. Um, and uh, so we can think of these functions here as vectors. in the vector space of functions of u and v. And then uh, what we have here is we have a bunch of vectors, f delta 1, l1, f delta 2, l2, and so on. And we're asking, uh, is it possible for these vectors to sum to 0? Oh, I forgot the equation. Is this a zero? Is it possible for these vectors to sum to zero with positive coefficients? Um, and the answer is, uh, well, it depends on the vectors. So uh, in this case, it's not possible if, let's say, these are, these are all the vectors that we have. Um, but in something like, uh, like that, then it is maybe, maybe possible. So here the positive cone spanned by these vectors contains the origin, and here it doesn't. And the way to distinguish between these two cases is, well, in the first case, we can find a plane through the origin. OK? So the plane goes through the origin, and all the vectors lie on one side of the plane. Okay, so I'll call this plane alpha, and I'll call it a separating plane. Okay, so the idea is uh, you plot all the vectors that can appear, and then you ask, can I find a separating plane uh, or not? And it's not actually obvious that you should be able to get anything out of this, um, but let's let's do an example, and we'll see that it's actually quite powerful. So, any questions? Yes. Um, that's right. So there isn't really a a, a nice. Um, Yeah, that, so, so the reason is that, so there is a nice basis for, for conformal blocks. They satisfy a conformal Casimir equation, um, so uh, they have nice properties. But as soon as you take a difference of cross blocks, you ruin all of that. This thing satisfies no nice differential equation that I know of, and there really isn't a nice structure that I know of on these functions. Um, Well, okay, so we know what uh, we don't know what the deltas are. Oh, sorry. Yes, exactly. We don't have we don't have any idea what the little f's are, except we know their squares are positive, and we have no idea what the deltas are either. 
The only thing we know is the form of this special function. Um, and uh, you, you could ask, like, why on earth would there be a situation where all the functions are pointing in one direction? Um, uh, why aren't they all kind of random? Um, and uh, one quick answer is that the conformal blocks themselves have some positivity built into them. Um, and that comes from the fact that uh, there you can think of them as an overlap of states. So we have x1 uh, and x2 on the cylinder, um, and x3 and x4 up here. And all we've done is inserted a projector O between them. And you can see that um, the projector O doesn't care about, uh, if, if I do a reflection, the projector O doesn't affect anything. So you should still have reflection positivity for the blocks. In particular, if you pick the configurations of points so that they're um, symmetrically arranged around a, a flip in dilatation time, then the block must be positive. So the blocks have positivity built into them. Um, so it, it makes sense um, that uh, maybe uh, they're always pointing in a particular direction. Other questions? Yes. Um, so the blocks, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, you can use the recursion relation to compute the blocks and then just take the difference to get this, uh, this difference. Um, but yeah, you could probably also write down a recursion for the difference itself. Other questions? OK, good. So let's do an example. Um, and I should say that this, uh, uh, this example is due to uh, Pedro and Joao, who Joao you'll meet next week. Um, but it's, a, it's a beautiful, very simple example where you can see everything. Um, so let me define uh, these new functions uh, h of z and z bar uh, to be just our f functions from before divided by the unit operator f. OK, this is just the definition uh, for convenience. And remember that uh, u and v in terms of z and z bar look like this. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to plot vectors associated to these functions um, that are two component vectors uh, of the following form. So that's the first component. Second component is. OK, so you can think of, of, of this thing. What this thing is doing is it's just, um, so this lives in an infinite dimensional space. And we're just uh, projecting it onto a two-dimensional subspace. Everyone OK with that? OK, good. So let's, uh, oh, and I should say that um, for this example, we're going to work in 2D. Um, where the blocks have uh, the form that I wrote in terms of hypergeometric functions. Um, so let's let's take a look. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do is already in uh, one of the files you downloaded. Um, it's a 2D vectors example, um, but I'll just code it up from scratch um, so that people can follow along. So uh, first, let's define the conformal blocks. So we had this function, uh, which was a hypergeometric function. Yes, that's a great idea. Um, that's probably not even enough. 
How's that? Great. Okay. So we had this hypergeometric function. Um, <coughs> was z to the beta over 2, hypergeometric to f1, beta over 2, beta over 2, beta z. That was our SL2 block. Um, and then the 2D conformal block was a function of delta and L, and z and z bar. And that was k of delta plus L z, k of delta minus L z bar plus K of delta plus L Z bar, K of delta minus L Z. Um, and then uh, I have this uh, function H that I've defined, which is a function of delta phi, delta, and L, and Z and Z bar. Um, and uh, okay, so what is this? So first we need a uh, V v to the delta phi uh, times a conformal block, uh, u to the delta phi times uh, the cross-channel conformal block. And uh, so what, swapping u and v, what does that do to z and z bar? Uh, not quite. So, yeah, if you look at this formula here, uh, you see that swapping u and v just corresponds to swapping z with 1 minus z and z bar with 1 minus z bar. At least that suffices to swap u and v, and you can convince yourself that that actually is the right prescription. Um, okay, so that was our f function. And now let's divide by um, the uh, f function for the unit operator. And the conformal block of the unit operator is just 1. So we just get these. OK. And uh, let's see. We also had a vector that we were making out of an h function, which was h of uh, 1 half uh, 3 fifths minus h of 1 half 1 third. I don't have to be that precise about this. H of uh, one half uh, three fifths minus H of one third one quarter. Um, and uh, for display purposes, so for figuring out whether these vectors can sum to zero with uh, uh, positive coefficients, the normalization of the vectors doesn't matter very much. Um, so I'm going to define a normalization that looks good in the display. Okay, so the vector we care about is this vector of h of delta phi, uh, delta, and l. And we'll give it some arbitrary normalization, which it will depend on the spin. And you'll see why I picked this in a moment. OK, and so the normalized vector is just this scale factor times the vector over the norm of the vector. OK, so any questions about uh, the code so far? None? OK, so good. So we just have these vectors defined. Um, and now let's, uh, let's plot them. So uh, let's take the specific case of delta phi is uh, 1 8. Um, that, uh, I happen to know, is the dimension of uh, the spin field in the 2D icing model. 
Okay, so that's why uh, it's interesting. Um, and we have to plot these vectors um, as a function of delta. Um, and uh, to solve this crossing equation, in, in principle, we can have any delta uh, obeying the unitarity bound. So what I'll do is write, I'll write delta is uh, L plus tau, uh, where tau is bigger than or equal to 0. So that's the unitarity bound in two dimensions. Tau is sometimes called the twist. OK. And uh, because uh, we're on a computer, we, have, we can't, uh, let's, uh, I'm going to plot it for just a finite range of tau from 0 0.1 to 4. That will be enough to see what's going on. I'll plot uh, vectors up to spin 14. Um, and, uh, and I'll explain what delta scalar min is supposed to do in a moment. Um, and there will be a couple objects that will be important for us. One of them is the stress tensor vector, and another is the table of all the block vectors. Okay, so the stress tensor vector is a normalized vector of delta phi, and the stress tensor has uh, spin 2 and dimension 2. Um, for the block vectors, we'll have a table of normalized vectors, delta phi, tau, L. Uh, from L goes to 0 to L max. Um, and uh, what should the step be in L? 2. Why 2? Right. No odd spin operators. Good. OK, so that step is 2. And then uh, we'll scan over tau. Um, and uh, we'll go from, uh, uh, so, so let's see. Um, I think I may have made a mistake in my previous version of the notebook, but that's OK. Oh, yeah, I know what the problem is. So the dimension is tau plus L. Uh, from tau min to tau max. Um, and we'll give it a different step for the scalars, uh, because we'll need to see the scalars in higher resolution than everything else. OK, so those are our block vectors. Uh, and now let's plot them. So list plot block vectors. And we'll make this look nice. Okay, so here we go. All right, so that's uh, pretty crazy looking. What what are all of these things? Um, so uh, this is the scalar, the scalar vector, uh, as you dial delta. So that's delta equals zero. And then we dial it up. It does this. It goes around. It comes back. And that would be, that's uh, delta equals 4. And it just converges as delta goes to infinity. Uh, this one is spin 2, the stress tensor. Um, at, well, and the stress tensor lives here at this end. And then those are the high dimension spin 2 operators. This is spin 4, spin 6, spin 8 and so on. Um, and let me, let me show the, uh, the stress tensor vector. 
just to give a point of reference. And I'll I'll draw a line between the stress tensor vector and minus the stress tensor vector. Oh, I made a mistake. Uh, let's see. I see. I just went from point 0.1. Let's go from point zero 0.01 for Taumin. Okay, good. So now you can see that this is the stress tensor, um, and this is minus the stress tensor. All right, so uh, if we have all these operators present in the theory, um, then just based on this plot, uh, is it possible to solve crossing symmetry? Let's get an opinion from everyone. Yeah. Well, who says it's possible to solve crossing symmetry? Okay. And who who says it's not? Okay. Good. Right. It's, it's possible. Um, and uh, so one one trivial solution um, is uh, uh, only the stress tensor, uh, no higher spin operators, and then uh, a scalar up here. Okay. So that obviously doesn't solve the full crossing equation, um, but it does solve the crossing equation in this subspace. Uh, in the space of functions of two variables that we've taken. Okay, so we're plotting a particular subspace, and there it looks like we can perfectly well just have the stress tensor and a scalar, and we're totally fine. Okay, um, so now, well, okay, what if we? Uh, uh, so here we're lit, we're allowing all operators consistent with the unitarity bound. Um, what if we start making some assumptions about the theory? So let's assume that. Um, the uh, all the scalars appearing um, have dimension larger than some value. Okay, so let's say larger than 0.1, um, and so that means that for the scalars, I should go from delta scalar min, uh, and otherwise I should start from uh, tau min. Thank you. Good. OK. So I'm going to, um, you know what the code looks like. So I'm going to zoom out to make it so that I can uh, manipulate things uh, and replot them. Um, OK. So good. So delta scalar min is 0.1. Um, and you remember, uh, this was uh, a scalar with dimension 0. So what we'll do is we'll shave away a little bit of this curve down here. OK, and indeed, we just shaved a little bit away. It's, it's moved over slightly. OK, so that's not a very strong assumption about our theory. Let's assume that all scalars have dimension bigger than uh, 0.3. Wow, OK, so we just, we just lost a huge amount of the curve. Let, let me do that less quickly. So 0.2, I'm going to zoom out so that the screen stops moving. OK, scalars uh, with dimension bigger than 0.2. OK, 1, 5, good. OK, so you can see that somewhere between uh, uh, 0.1 and 0.2, um, this curve starts to disappear rapidly. And the reason for the bumpiness is because uh, we're interpolating. So I've, there are just a few points that are being plotted here, and it's interpolating. Um, OK, good. So, so what if I set uh, scale, delta scalar min equal to 2? All right, so now almost the whole curve has disappeared, and these are the scalars. Uh, so now, uh, let's ask, is it possible to solve crossing symmetry in this case? No, no, it's not. Uh, all the vectors lie on uh, on one side of a separating plane. I could take the plane to be this or this or whatever. They're all on one side. Um, and uh, even though we're just plotting things in two dimensions, we can conclude rigorously from this plot that it's not possible to solve the whole crossing equation 
because this plot gives a, a proof by contradiction that the entire crossing equation can't be solved in this case. Okay? So the conclusion is that there do not exist 2D unitary CFTs with a dimension 1 8 scalar operator such that all the scalars in the OPE of that operator with itself have dimension larger than 2. Yes? Right. Oh, good question. So, so the spins, uh, you can already see sort of what's happening. Um, the, they, just, they just converge in a, in a very simple way. Um, so in particular, this separating plane here, you can prove analytically, if you like, that the large spin blocks um, lie on one side of this separating plane. So yeah, so I picked some, some arbitrary L max and delta max. And the reason is because things are just converging uh, at large spin and large delta. Um, yeah, I mean, you know all these functions. Um, they're hypergeometric functions. So you can just, uh, just compute their asymptotic behavior. Good question. OK, so this is the core logic uh, in this technique. Um, so please ask questions. Yes? Um, so, how, how do you get started with these techniques? Oh, you're you're saying you're an experimentalist, and you. Um, good. So uh, you'll have to wait uh, a few minutes. Other questions? Um, good. So, so let's suppose that crossing held that equation. Let's suppose that it holds. Now, uh, now let's evaluate that equation at these points. Okay. Um, now I claim if we look at um, the second component, if we look at minus this. Um, then it's positive block by block. Um, but that means it's not possible to solve that equation with positive coefficients. So what you do, so this thing, this is our separating plane in this case, alpha of h. So we have our equation that says that sum over O of f phi phi o squared h delta l um, is 0. And we want to know if this is possible. Um, so let's assume it is. Now apply alpha. We get sum over o f phi phi o squared alpha of h delta l equals 0. But this is greater than 0, and this is greater than 0, so you're screwed. OK, so um, all we need is one functional. It's an infinite dimensional space, but by looking at the dual space, uh, we can prove things about it without an infinite amount of work. Um, uh, if you want to interpret it as an inner product, um, I mean, I, I would say it's more the expectation value of those three operators in the vacuum state. Um, uh, it, it just has to be um, uh, real. It doesn't have to be positive.
Um, re oh, so, so, so when you take this correlator and uh, you take its Hermitian conjugate, um, then uh, so the real thing to do is to just take here, probably shouldn't have said anything about reflection positivity. Let's just take this three-point function um, phi uh, phi of x phi of y o of z. Um, and uh, let's think in Minkowski signature. So these are now Minkowski points. So then the operators uh, don't, they're not uh, reflection Hermitian, they're just Hermitian. Okay? And so now take a uh, star of this, this is time ordered. Um, this had better just be equal to itself. Because all the operators are Hermitian. Um, this is unitarity. I mean, the fact that you have Hermitian conjugation, and it's consistent with the uh, with the taking expectation values and inner products is also consequence of unitarity. Yes. Uh, how hard is it to pick those numbers? Um, Pedro, how hard is it to pick these numbers? Yeah. So it's a point rounded with loss one half. Uh okay. Um good. So so uh we disproved a state uh, a um a statement about CFTs. We we showed that uh uh there must exist a scalar operator with dimension less than two. Um, and uh, we can we can do better. So what if we have delta scalar min is 1.5? Well, we still can't solve crossing 1.2. Still can't solve crossing 1.1. Still can't solve crossing uh, 1.01. Okay, now we can. And the crossover point is about 1.036. So the conclusion um, is that uh, there exists a scalar with dimension delta less than 1.036. Uh, so this is in a 2D CFT with a scalar operator with dimension 1.8. So does anybody know what the dimension of the lowest dimension scalar appearing in the sigma sigma OPE is in the 2D icing model? <coughs> yes. Speak up. One. One. Okay. So actual answer. One. Okay. So. Uh, this bound, it, it looked like we were just doing kind of crazy ad hoc things, but the bound is actually nearly saturated at the 4% level just by this simple exercise. Um, yeah, that's right. So the bound that you can get um, depends on which functional you choose. Um, Exactly, and that, that's what we're going to do next. So the idea is you get different bounds depending on different functionals. So we should pick the functional that gives the best possible bound. Different points. 
these. Yeah, sorry, that's what I meant by functional. I, I guess I, I was jumping ahead a little bit, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, if you if you plot different it points, then you get different bounds. Like the the picture will just look different, and this exercise that we do will give a different answer. So you need to pick the points um, that give the best possible bound. Yes. Um, so uh, I th I think I have time. So so next, what I'm going to do is is show you um, how these uh, how these computations how uh, how these computations are actually done. How to get the really very best bounds, and you'll see that the asymptotics are under good control with these techniques. Okay. But this is just to give you a flavor of why the bounds exist. So uh, let me let's generalize what we did. Uh, we start by making an assumption. about the spectrum. And as an example, we said that uh, all scalars have dimension uh, bigger than some delta min. So that's what we were doing there. Um, and so now we try to find a separating plane. So a separating plane is a functional that takes a function of two variables to the real numbers um, such that this functional is positive um, for all delta and L in the spectrum. Um, so what that means in our example is that we have to demand positivity for delta bigger than um, L plus D minus 2 when L is bigger than 0 and delta bigger than delta min for L equals 0. Okay, So this is where our assumption enters. Uh, our assumption about the spectrum enters in the uh, delta and L for which we demand positivity. So if we succeed in finding such an alpha, then the spectrum that we hypothesized is ruled out. And uh, the logic for that is exactly this here. We assume there's a solution to crossing, then we apply alpha to it, and we get a contradiction. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to talk about the the numerical techniques uh, the most modern numerical techniques that one can use to try to solve these kinds of problems. Um, and I should say the most difficult step here um, is in finding some functional. 
Okay? This functional has to satisfy all these inequalities, and it's actually an infinite number of inequalities. So you have all these constraints, and you have to solve them. Um, and uh, so this is an optimization problem, basically. Um, it's an example of uh, uh, basically an infinite dimensional, infinite number of constraints linear programming problem. Um, and uh, a lot of the work that's been happening um, since this paper has involved uh, coming up with efficient techniques for solving these kinds of uh, infinite problems, infinite optimization problems. Um, so uh, the types of things that people have done to deal with this infinity, so we have infinite uh, inequalities in infinite dimensions. So the first thing, uh, the solution to the problem uh, of infinite dimensions, um, we've already seen. You just just look in a finite dimensional space of functionals. So if you look in a small dimensional space, you'll get some bounds. They may not be the best bounds. If you look in a larger dimensional space, you could get better bounds. Um, and eventually you want to take the dimension of the space you look in as big as possible and then you'll get the best possible bounds. Okay, so uh, as an example, um, for what comes next, we're going to look at a particular subspace of functionals, which are a sum of derivatives, um, so uh, a sum over, uh, over derivatives, m and n, with respect to z and z bar, of f, around the crossing symmetric point, z equals z bar equals 1 half. Okay, and our finite dimensional space will just be, we'll look at up to a finite number of derivatives, lambda. So, so that solves that infinity. We, we've, we've had to compromise in that uh, we may not uh, get all the information possible, but at least we'll still get true rigorous information, in the same sense that this was rigorous and true, even though we only worked in two dimensions. Okay, so this other one is trickier, um, and uh, people have done a few different things. One is to uh, discretize the deltas, so you take your infinite, continuously infinite number of constraints, you just chop up the deltas into very fine steps, and you turn it into a very large finite number of constraints. Um, once you have a finite number of constraint of linear inequalities in a finite dimensional space, that's called a linear programming problem, and this is something you can solve on a computer. And this is what was originally done um, in the paper by Rotazzi, Richkov, Tani, and Vicky. Um, uh, another thing that people have done uh, is uh, write a, a custom uh, LP solver um, that uh, can deal with this infinite number of, of constraints. Um, and the technique that I'll talk about today is something called semi-definite programming. Um, and uh, this has the advantage of being uh, pretty fast, um, dealing nicely with the asymptotics, and not requiring any sort of discretization in the dimensions. Okay, so uh, what is semi-definite programming? So with semi-definite programming, we can solve problems of the following form. Find a vector a such that a dot a vector of polynomials 
is greater than 0 for all x bigger than or equal to 0. So we have constraints that look like this. Uh, we have alpha of f delta l delta phi. This is a sum over derivatives a, m, n, d, m, d, n with respect to z and z bar of f delta phi delta l z z bar at the crossing symmetric point. And this has to be bigger than or equal to 0. Uh, so we can use semi-definite programming if we can write um, this thing, or approximate this thing, as a sum of a m n times polynomials in delta times some positive function. of delta. OK, so in particular, the way we would use it is uh, we, would, um, we would write delta is delta min uh, depending on L plus x. So delta min L would be either the unitarity bound uh, for, a large L, uh, for L greater than 0 or this delta min that we pick for the scalars. Um, and now, well, if we have a positive function of delta, then the, it doesn't matter in this inequality. And so now we have an inequality of the form uh, sum over mn of a m n times polynomials in x is bigger than or equal to 0 for all x bigger than or equal to 0. No. Uh, 1x. Um, good. OK, so yeah, actually, thank you. So you can have more than one of these constraints. OK, so each constraint is a univariate constraint. So uh, uh, we would have um, here j corresponds to l. So maybe I should just write it as l. OK, so there's a, a, a single variable polynomial for each l. This is a, a times, not an x. OK, so I, I'm, yes? This? Here? OK, so, um, so I claim that if we can take this junk and write it as a sum of polynomials in delta times a positive function of delta, then we can apply semi-definite programming. So this is. Uh, a sum over a m n, the coefficients in our functional alpha, times polynomials of delta, um, and this is some positive function of delta. Okay. Um, this is. Uh, I'll rewrite it. So the way we apply semi-definite programming is we write delta is equal to delta min of l plus x, where x is bigger than or equal to 0. Yes? Um, yes, the positive function can depend on l. Let me give it a name.
Yes. Uh, so alpha is defined here. So this is an arbitrary choice. I'm choosing to look at functionals of this form. So over there, I chose to look at functionals of the form h at one point minus h of an, at another point. But I, but in general, all I'm doing is applying a linear functional to h. So you can evaluate it at different points. You can take sums of values at different points. You can take sums of derivatives at different points. Whatever you like. Good. So, um, so z equals z bar equals a half is the crossing symmetric point. Um, it's the point at which both uh, channels for the conformal block expansion converge equally well. Um, and so basically what we're doing is we're sitting on that point uh, and then we're just probing a neighborhood at that point. Um, it's not obvious that this is the best thing to do. Um, and actually it's sort of a historical accident that um, people looked at functionals of this form. Um, but uh, it does turn out to be important for semi-definite programming to use these kinds of functionals. Um, so I should say it's worth exploring other kinds of functionals. Um, that's something that really hasn't been done enough. Um, and there's an infinite dimensional space, so there's lots of place to play, uh, lots of room to play around. Um, and we don't know what the optimal functionals look like. Uh, All right, good. So um, a, uh, on a computer, yes, yeah, semi-definite programming needs a finite number of L's. Um, so L from 0 up to L max. Um, and here is one case where you have to be careful about asymptotics. Here you really need to truncate the number of spins. Um, and so you need to make sure that the answers you get don't change when you change L max. Um, the, the infinity that this, uh, uh, the asymptotic thing that this does deal with um, is this approximation turns out to be asymptotically good at large delta. So the large delta behavior is totally under control. The large L behavior is something you have to worry about. Um, the blocks uh, always converge at sufficiently large L. It's just a question of how large you need to take it. Yes? So I haven't proved this yet. So uh, if we can find an approximation like this, um, then we can apply semi-definite programming. The reason I wrote a, a, a wavy equals is because this will not literally be true. Um, there do not exist polynomials uh, such that this is true. On the other hand, there exists a, a family of polynomials that arbitrarily well approximate the blocks in this way. These are polynomials. So the P, P and MNs are polynomials, and the chi's are not necessarily polynomials. Um, yeah, I mean, chi's chi times, times polynomials. Yeah, I mean, they will collect, correctly reproduce the asymptotics. Um, that is an excellent question. Uh, let me um, let me show you an example of coming up with this approximation, and then and that that will be made clear. Okay, so um, I just said if we can find such a thing, then we can apply semi-definite programming, um, and uh, this is. Um, this is historically what, uh, what we started with. We just said, oh, well, there's this great technique, semi-definite programming. Can we possibly apply it? Um, and it turns out that, that you can. And it's actually, uh, um, it follows from the conformal algebra that there exist exponentially good approximations to derivatives of the blocks in terms of polynomials. Um, and I won't. I won't show you why that is in complete generality here, but I'll just demonstrate an example.
which are SL2 blocks, which were just these hypergeometric functions. Um, so uh, the, the SL2 blocks, uh, we had this function k beta of z. Um, there's a hypergeometric transformation that lets you write this uh, in terms of a different variable, which I'll define in a moment. OK, and here rho is z over 1 plus square root of 1 minus z squared. Um, so rho turns out to be the right variable to think about conformal blocks in. Um, and I won't explain that here, but it's in the lecture notes um, that are on the wiki. So you can have a look at that, and it'll explain uh, the rho variable. Um, OK, so uh, good. So th this is this k beta of z. This was the holomorphic part of the 2D conformal block. Um, and so this thing has, uh, oh, and I should say that uh, rho of z equals 1 half is uh, about 0 0.17. So it's uh, 3 minus 2 root 2. So uh, uh, if we expand, if we do a power series in rho, we get a, a pretty rapidly convergent expansion. And it looks like this. OK, so now I can answer your question. Um, the blocks do indeed have poles in delta. So remember here, beta beta in the 2D blocks was uh, delta plus L uh, and delta minus L. Uh, so there are indeed poles um, at negative integer values of beta. Um, but uh, the poles will always occur at values of, uh, of delta that violate the unitarity bound. The reason is because the unitarity bound comes from demanding that all descendants have positive norm. And the poles are coming from dividing by norms of descendants. So the poles are, are, are guaranteed to be positive in a unitary theory. So there are poles in delta, but they're in a region where you don't care. Um, so the idea to get a polynomial approximation is to truncate this. at some large order. Uh, and then you get that this is equal to rho to the beta over 2 over uh, a product of poles up to your truncation order, beta plus k, times some uh, polynomial in beta and rho. Um, so when you take derivatives, at 1 half, what do the derivatives do? Well, uh, they, they, uh, um, they can act on this and adjust the coefficients of this. And you can also bring down powers of beta from this thing. Um, but uh, you just get that this is um, equal to uh, the crossing symmetric value of rho, which I'll call rho star. So this is just rho star to the beta over 2 minus product of poles. Uh, over product of poles um, times some polynomial uh, in beta. Um, and uh, so the validity of this approximation is controlled by how many terms you keep in this sum. Um, each term is suppressed by uh, 0 0.17 to the 2k, so 0 0.0 something to the 2k. So it converges extremely rapidly. And the other property is that each term is bounded uh, as delta goes to infinity, or beta goes to infinity. 
So you can see you have equal powers of beta on the top and the bottom. So uh, the convergence, uh, as you take more and more terms, is actually uniform for all beta. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very well-behaved approximation. Um, so by using this uh, approximation, along with the formula for the 2D conformal blocks, uh, you can verify um, that there is uh, a formula of the form we wanted here. Basically, this positive function is a product of the uh, positive functions up front for each um, for the holomorphic block and the antiholomorphic block. So that rho star to the beta over 2 over a product of uh, betas, you just get two copies of that. That's the positive uh, function. And then the polynomials are the products of the polynomial from the antiholomorphic part and the holomorphic part. Um, and uh, so this looks like it's very special to 2D, but uh, also 4D, they also depend on this fun these functions, so you can do the same thing in 4D. Um, and it turns out that actually this structure is very general and tr it, uh, holds in any number of dimensions. That's a consequence of the conformal algebra, and I can maybe tell you about that uh, offline. Questions? Uh-huh. Right. So the question is, uh, we don't have, in odd dimensions, we don't have uh, expressions for the conformal blocks in terms of elementary functions, like we do in even dimensions. So how do you do this? And the answer is that you need a way to compute these approximations for the blocks. Um, to arbitrarily good uh, approximation. Um, and uh, for that, there are a number of techniques. One of them is you can just solve the conformal Casimir equation order by order in row. And that just gives you the answer. Yes? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's actually a consequence of conformal invariant uh, of, of the conformal algebra. The poles are at negative integer values of delta, sometimes negative half integers. Um, and uh, there are experts on this fact in the audience, so uh, I can introduce you to them. Um, yeah, uh, good. Uh, other questions? Yes. Um, so, uh, uh, nope, the same tricks work for every conformal block. Um, uh, Non-identical operator dimensions, uh, operators with spin, super conformal blocks, super conformal blocks with spin, whatever you want. It's a, a Virasoro blocks, super Virasoro blocks, W algebra blocks, all your blocks. Uh, it works for all the blocks, um, and it's a consequence of, of the conformal algebra. Okay, so um, Tom's uh, uh, disappointed. I haven't. So uh, does that mean I get to I get to keep going? <laughs> so the question is, yeah, should I should I keep going now or? Yeah, but I don't I don't I don't want to I, I don't want to um, uh, give away the punchline. <laughs> So should I continue now or should I continue later? Uh, it's it's hard for me to predict. Um, try. Okay. Um, I, I, okay. How about how about twenty minutes? Is that okay? I could do it later. Okay. Yep. I've summarized everything. Yeah. Okay.